Okay, guys, welcome to this week's uh, ECGSA Academic Seminar. For this week, we are very honored to invite Dr. Sadat Pat. So let me give you uh, some very brief introduction for Dr. Pat. He got his, uh, he's now a, Dr. Pat is now a postdoc at, uh, as you can see, Raytheon Media and Technologies. He got his uh, bachelor degree from Jadavpur University in India in 2011. And then he got his master and PhD from here, uh, in the EC department, in the University of Maryland, in 2014 and 2015. And he is working for, he was working for Professor uh, Kalkowski and uh, Professor uh, Richard Lau. And he's going to give us a very simple talk about, about networks. Ooh. All right, good afternoon everyone, uh, glad to be back. So today I'm going to talk about uh, networks. Uh, I'm going to talk about big, massive networks and they might be complex because, well, uh, networks might show, massive scale networks might show properties or behaviors which cannot be explained by their individual components. And later I'm going to talk, also going to talk about mathematical models called random graphs, which are used to study networks, such kind of networks. So what is a network? So network, mathematically a network consists of a set of nodes, right, a set of nodes. And you have edges, you have a set of edges which connect these nodes pairwise, okay? So that's a network. You can also call it a graph, okay? More physically, uh, a network could be thought of as a system which is composed of the number of individual subsystems or components linked together. Okay. So there could be there are a number of examples of real world networks. You could have I mean you could think of the internet as a massive network consisting of uh, computers or routers or other related devices which could be thought of as the nodes. And the links or the edges could be thought of as the real physical layer connections. And then you also have social networks like Facebook or Twitter, where the nodes are the individuals and the connections are like friendship relationships or so forth. Okay. Now, uh, if you have such a system which could be thought of as a network, why do we need to, I mean, what could be the aspects of studying such a system? Okay, firstly, you could think of studying the individual components, or you could think of studying the links themselves. And the third, and the third aspect could be to study the pattern of connections between these components, that is to study the network structure. So studying the network structure allows one to kind of abstract out the system and just look at the pattern of connections and see how that affects the behavior of the system. Okay, so let's. So this is the this is the image of the this is the visual representation of the internet of the internet as it looked in 2003. It came out of the Opt project, uh, which was tasked with visualizing the internet uh, and mapping it into a network. So, as you can see, you in the periphery you have a number of nodes which are kind of low degree which have less number of connections and then you have these hubs which uh, which are kind of highly connected but other than that if you just look at this picture right I mean can you say anything more about it right you can't really comment anything more so therefore for visualizing networks of massive scales you need to uh, come up with some statistical properties or also called network properties that allows you to study the network in further detail. Right? You could have, so there are really, broadly speaking, there are two kinds of network properties. The global network properties looks at the network at the whole, <coughs> in the whole, and you have local network properties which looks at more, uh, which looks at the local neighborhood of the nodes in the network. So now I will describe now I'll describe the, the 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 important network properties 
which are kind of used very often in this field. But before I move on, are there any questions? Uh, we talked about networks in general. I introduced the idea of networks and why we would like to study the network structure to understand the behavior of the system. And from that, we directly, that led us to kind of uh, introducing statistical properties that needs to be uh, kind of introduced so that one can analyze the network in further detail. Are there any questions before I move ahead? Yeah. Can you um, talk about uh, or how, how do you define a complex network? So a complex network is really a network which is like first of all it's like massive, and also it shows certain properties. I mean, it doesn't have any particular definition, but it shows certain properties or behaviors which cannot be explained by simply looking at the. Which cannot be simply explained by looking at by just looking at the components, just at the nodes. You have to look at the pattern of connections to kind of explain the and explain the behavior of the entire system. Yeah, you're over time. Yeah, uh, yeah you can look at the temporal behavior. Yeah. It is the knowledge com complex network you have mentioned similar to. The same as those uh, doing the physics. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So people in statistical physics use this terminology a lot. Complex networks, and the field is sometimes called network science, right. a science of such massive scale networks. Okay. So before we kind of describe the network properties, uh, I'd like to set some notation so that everyone is on the same ground. So we're dealing, suppose you have a graph G. So the graph, you have a graph G, which is composed of a vertex set V, that is a set of vertices or nodes. And you have uh, the set of edges that's called the edge set E. Now, two nodes I and J are adjacent if the cubicle IJ belongs in the edge set. Okay? And the degree of a node I is basically the number of connections that the node has in the network. And you can represent it in this map, in this manner. Okay. So, what is the degree distribution? So, we, we for a given graph, we define the degree of all the nodes. So, the distribution of the node degrees in the network is called the degree distribution. Okay, uh, and the degree distribution is kind of probability mass function. And if you call it p, so the p of d, right? P of d is the fraction of nodes which have a degree d. Okay, so uh, again, to, to recap, uh, the degree distribution is the distribution of the node degrees in the network, and it looks at the fraction of nodes in the network with varying degrees. Okay, and it should be clear that on a graph on n nodes, the, the, the support of the PMF is on 0 to n minus 1, because no node can have more than n minus 1 connections in in a graph on n nodes. Okay, so so to kind of get to make this point more clear, because this is a very important property, and we'll use this property uh, uh, in the later parts of in the later parts of the slide. So if you look at this example, this simple example, right, you have a triangle here, and you have a line going up. So what's the degree distribution of this graph? Okay, so first of all, what's the fraction of nodes? that have zero degrees, that is isolated. You don't have any, you don't have any nodes that are isolated. So you have, the entry here is zero. What is the fraction of nodes that, have, that are degree one? One, right, one. You have just one node. This node is degree one, and the fraction is one over four. So therefore you have 0.25 here, okay? So what's the fraction of nodes that, have degree, that are degree two? So that's 2 over 4.5, and therefore you have a 0 0.5 here. And again, uh, the rest is 0 0.25. So this is, the, this is how the degree distribution will look for this simple graph. Now, if you look at cycles, so what should be the degree distribution of a cycle? Sorry? So you should only have mass at d equals 2, because all the, all the nodes have degree 2. <laughs> For, uh, so, and for this complete graph, complete graph being that uh, the definition of complete graph is that all the nodes in the graph are connected to each other. 
So what should be the degree distribution of this complete graph on five nodes? So all the mass should be at four, right? <laughs> and no mass elsewhere. So uh, are we clear what, uh, what's the degree distribution, how it looks, or any questions before I move forward? Yes. You are focused on uh, underactive graph, right? Exactly, underactive, with no self loops, yes. That's, that's, a, that's a good classification. Okay, next I will introduce another uh, statistical property, a very important statistical property called the clustering coefficient. Uh, there are a number of clustering coefficients, and basically what they measure is that they, it gives you a measure of how well the, the nodes in the graphs are clustered together. It's uh, it's seen that social networks tend to exhibit clustering, and therefore this network property is of great interest. So let's define the first. Let's define the local clustering coefficient of a particular node. So when you're looking at the so the clustering coefficient of a particular node i, called c of i, is basically the fraction of pairs of neighbors that are themselves connected. Okay, so if you're looking at i, you're summing over all j and k such that i is connected to j, i is connected to k, and k is connected to j, divided by, uh, for a particular i, you're summing over j and k such that i is connected to j and i is connected to k. You're not, I mean, not restricting that j has to be connected to k or not. Okay? So if, if uh, j is connected to k here, that's called uh, open try, and if j is Connected to K is called a closed trial. So basically, I'm looking at the, the number of closed trials divi divided by the sum of all the, the, the total number of trials. Okay. So that's the local clustering coefficient. That's a local network property. If you average all the local clustering coefficients, you get a network property, a global network property, which is called the average clustering coefficient, which is just the average of all the clustering coefficients. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is a really simple graph, and what's the clustering coefficient of node A? So this is A, this is B, C, D. What's the clustering coefficient of A? So you're looking at, so what's the, what's the number of closed trials, right? So you have B, A, C, you have C, A, D, right? So there's B, A, B, A, C, I'm sorry, A, B, A, B, A, C, and B, C, right? So this is a closed trial. That's another closed trial. So that's two, num two closed trials. And what's the total number of trials? You have this a closed trial, that's a closed trial, and this is an open trial, B, A, and A, D. So that's two over three. That's the clustering coefficient of A, and because of symmetry, the clustering coefficient of C should also be two over three. Now what's the clustering coefficient of B and D? So B, uh, there's only one trial, and that's a closed trial. Therefore, the clustering coefficient of B and D both is equals to one. And if you average out over, all, I mean, if you average over all the clustering coefficients, you get 506. That's the average clustering coefficient. Okay, uh, is this clear? The idea of well, local? Uh, which, which is A, B, C, D? Uh, oh, is it not clear? So this is A. So I, I guess you can't see the labels. It's not clear, probably. This is A. This is B. This is C. This is D. Can anyone see the labels in the? No. It's difficult at the second row. So perhaps so, you can go at a point or draw something. Yeah. So this is this is. Uh, yes. uh, there is no way to draw. Can't see the label. Yeah. So, oh, yeah, I do have. Maybe I can draw. Yeah. So in this figure. So it's clockwise. A, B, B C, oh. D. Yeah, this is the graph. Okay. Okay. So that's the that's the graph. And so again, uh, the clustering coefficient of A, you're looking at all the numerically you're looking at all the open trials in all the closed trials. So that's for A, you have B A C and C A D. Mm -hmm. And then all the all the trials you have these two, and also you have B A D. Okay, so it's two over three, and for B and D, you just have one trial, and that's the closed trial. Now we can also define what's called the global clustering coefficient, which is three times the number of triangles divided by the total number of trials. So three times the number of triangles is basically the number of closed trials in the entire network, 
-hmm. So if there's a factor of three because uh, you have a triple counting, you you count you count a particular triangle three times when you are counting the trials, you're counting the closed trials, and and here in the denominator you're looking at the the total number of trials closed and open. In general, uh, I mean, unless you are you're dealing with really special cases, the average clustering coefficient will be different from the global clustering coefficient. Okay. So if you look at special cases, what should be the clustering coefficients of a complete graph? So they should all be one because if you if you're looking at a particular node, you are looking at its if you at a particular node at a particular node, you're looking at the neighbors. All the neighbors will be connected. Therefore, all the clustering coefficients of complete graphs should be one. And if you're looking at a tree, right? A tree meaning that you don't have any cycles in a graph, then all the clustering coefficients which should be zero for a tree. Okay. So before I go forward, are there any questions? Any? Yes. So of course, the, those coefficients can have uh, different um, definitions, right? So are these definitions particularly arrived? Uh, uh, was derived from uh, other uh, models or something? So where have they come from? Yes. So first, so basically, you're trying to you look at you look at networks, right? And you want to study the properties of networks. So you see that networks, like many networks, like social networks, tend to be clustered. And you want to you want to describe and you want to find you want to kind of find a property for that clustering. So here you're only looking at triangles. So basically the clustering coefficients that I described here, you are only looking at the triangles, the count of triangles. Right? So closed triad is a triangle. And an open triad, you just you, there's no uh, triangle over there. So you're just looking at the triangles for the clustering coefficient. You could have you can define other coefficients that kind of in uh, uh, that kind of try to explain cl uh, clustering by looking at higher order cycles or cliques. But then uh, the, the idea behind this is that this is computationally, I mean, it's easy to compute and it's not too computationally expensive. Okay. So, and there are many other network properties other than degree distribution and clustering coefficient. There's something called the assertivity, which looks at the correlation coefficient of attributes or between pairs of linked nodes. So basically, if the attribute is a degree, the degree a uh, degree associative network would be such a network where a higher degree node will be more. It will be more likely for a higher degree node to be connected to other high degree nodes, and a low degree node would be more likely to be connected to uh, other low degree nodes, and a network would be degree disassociative if it's more likely that a higher degree node is connected to a lower degree node. For example, a star, right? A star, I'm, yeah, star, where you have, at the center, you have a high degree node and you have spokes going out. So there, uh, all the low degree nodes are connected to the hub, and the hub is connected only to a uh, lower degree node. So that's a degree uh, disassociative network. Other, there are other network properties as well, which look at the diameter of the network. So if you define the shortest part between any two nodes, the diameter of the network would be the longest such shortest path. And then you also have number of, the number and size of components and connectivity for uh, networks. But we're not going to go into these network properties in this talk. OK, so now I'm going to describe. So we looked at, previously we looked at uh, two network properties of interest. That's the degree distribution and the clustering coefficient. Uh, and next we're going to look at mathematical models which are used for studying, which are used for studying uh, those kind of complex networks. So for defining a random graph model, I introduce this notation G of V, which is basically the set of all graphs on vertex set V. Okay, so what is the cardinality of this uh, collection? Two to the power. Two to the power. Oh, and choose two to the power and choose. 
Uh, no, it's 2 to the power, if the cardinality of V is n, it's 2 to the power n choose 2. So pretty huge, right? And so what the what a random graph does is that it's basically a graph value random variable taking values in this space, this space or, or these collections of graphs. So the modeling aspect is that you uh, you have to specify the measure on these uh, on these space of graphs. That's and you have to specify the measure on G of V. That's the task of random graph model. The question is, first, uh, is this uh, definition clear? Is this definition of random? I, I know it's, uh, I mean, unless we see an example, it will be very difficult to understand. So I guess not many would have understood this definition, but it's fine. Uh, I think the rest will catch up. So uh, so first, uh, the first question that arises is, why do we need uh, random graphs? So first of all, random graphs are easy to generate, and they can be mathematically analyzed. and how do you apply random graphs? So suppose you have a, you have a system at hand, right? And you want to kind of study the behavior of the system, or you want to predict the behavior of the system. What you do is that you 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 compute the property, the statistical properties of the system, and then you come up with a random graph whose properties would match that of the system. And now you do your simulations or your mathematical analysis on this random graph, and with the hope that that will carry forward to the real world system. So that's how you use a random graph. Otherwise, other ways of using a random graph would be that suppose you want to design a system with certain behavior, certain uh, favorable properties. You start off with a random graph and uh, create a random graph which would satisfy those properties that you need. And from using that random graph uh, generative model, you generate a system according to your specifications. That's another way of using a random graph. Okay. So another thing is that uh, another important point to note is that, as I mentioned before, you have a huge number of possible graphs uh, on a particular vertex set. So really, one needs to model typical graphs, like what graphs are more typical in real world. And random graphs gives you a very good tool for doing that. And also another point we note uh, before we go forward is that we're really interested in studying large networks, and therefore we'll be studying asymptotics in random graphs. That is, we'll be studying how the random graph will behave as the size of the vertex set grows with time. Or you look at the you uh, you look at sequences of random graphs such that the vertex set keeps growing. Okay. Okay. So here I am defining the notation for. Uh, asymptotics in random graph models. Uh, is everyone with me or did I lose me? Yes. Um, I'm wondering why do you want to generate those kind of random graphs? Why, why do you want to generate random graphs? So, random graphs really gives, suppose you have a real world network, uh, so random graphs gives you a way of, like, I mean, you have just one instance of a real world network, right? So this, the random graph will give you different instances. Will give you ways of generating the dif like different instances, and now you can do a simulation on those instances. But uh, I already get have one. Why do we have? Why do I want another one? Well, now as the graph, I mean, with time, as the graph will evolve, you want, you might want to look. I mean, you might want to predict how that behaves. So for that, if you have a model to for the uh, real world network, that will help you in studying the behavior or predict the behavior as the network grows or as it be, uh, how it would behave with time. And another way is that another aspect is that if you want to design, if you don't have a network, but you want to design a network with certain properties, then random graph is a tool for doing that. So you want to start, uh, suppose you want to design a system which has say a certain degree distribution uh, with certain clustering coefficients or maybe with a certain diameter. Uh, you could maybe look at random graphs for generating such kind of networks. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, asymptotics in random graph models. So, we look at the sequence of random graphs, G of n, n in naturals. And for a fixed n, we have a random graph G of n, which composes of, which is composed of vertex set Vn and a random x set E of n. 
Okay, if the S set is random, but the vertex set is deterministic. And the degree, so D and K is the degree of node K in the graph G N. Degree of node K in graph G N. So that's so D and K is now a random variable. Okay. And NND, NND, this notation NND is the number of nodes in GN with degree D. So NND over N would be the fraction of nodes uh, in your graph GN with degree D. Okay. Now, how, I mean, what's the sense of asymptotics here? Well, in the sequence of GNs, the sequence of vertex sets are assumed to be increasing. Okay. The, the kernel is increasing. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, describe a very, uh, very important random graph model, which is called the uh, Erdős-Rényi graphs. It was, it was introduced in 1958, and it has been very popular since then because it's so easy to like, formulate, and it's very, it's mathematically tractable, and it shows many interesting properties. And because of those reasons, it has been very popular since it has been proposed. Okay, so auditionary graph G and P, denoted as G and P, consists of n nodes, and you have a link probability P, which means that any two nodes in the graph will be connected by a probability P, and all those connections take place independently. Okay? And one can easily show that the, the, the degrees of all the nodes will be binomial random variables. Okay? So is the setting of auditionary graphs clear to everyone? So again, auditionary graphs G and P, you have n nodes, and the probability of connection between any two nodes will be P. It's a very homogeneous graph in that sense. Okay. So, so asymptotics, as n increases, do we need to scale P, or how should we scale P, so that, uh, first question is, so that the degree distribution converges, so that you get a non-trivial degree distribution. Let's see what that means. So if, if you're looking at n large, if, and the scaling is p equals c over n. That means that as your as n grows, the probability of connection will decay as one over n. Okay, and I have chosen c equals two, so it will decay as two over n. Okay, so what we see is that so this should be uh, so this is the Poisson distribution with uh, lambda equals two with the parameter uh, lambda equals two. And what we see is that for n equals 10, when, when, the, when you're looking at g and p with n equals 10 and p equals 2 over 10, uh, the degree distribution is really all over the place. Okay? And then n equals 100, uh, you're getting that, but still, I mean, not really close. But n equals 1000, you're really close to the Poisson distribution. Okay, so what we show from this simulation is that as the size of the graph grows, as you're looking at larger and larger graphs, the degree distribution will converge to a Poisson distribution. Okay? And if your P is C over N, the degree distribution will converge to Poisson distribution with parameter lambda equals C. Okay? It, does it, is this graph clear to everyone? Or uh, any questions? Okay. okay, so suppose, I mean, I just showed one scaling, right? P equals C over N. What happens if you're doing a different scaling? If the, the link probabilities are scaled in a different fashion. So if you're scaling at a rate lesser than c over n, that is the, the link probabilities are lesser than c over n, then the node degrees converge to zero. The degrees of all the nodes will converge to zero. Okay? And if you're scaling at a rate greater than c over n, that is the, the, the link probabilities are greater than c over n, then the degrees of nodes will go to infinity. Okay, will grow in unbounded fashion. So let's see that. So, so this was the Poisson distribution at n equals ten. If it, so the scaling is c over n to the one point two. Okay, so it's basically your scaling. So link probabilities are lesser than c over n. Okay, so they're lower link probabilities. So correct, the probability of corrections will be lower. So under this scaling, what we show is that for n equals ten you have something, and then equals 100, uh, you have greater probabilities of having lower degrees. So the, the number of nodes with lower degrees is higher. And, and as, as n becomes 5,000, for n equals 5,000, you have far more number of nodes with 
lower degree. So what happens is that as n will grow, the mass will mo keep moving to the left, right? And you will have all the mass at d equals 0. So all, most of the nodes will become isolated. Okay? So at any scaling that's less than c over n. Now as for a scaling that is greater than c over n, that is the link probabilities are greater than c over n with n, what happens is that, so this was the Poisson distribution, at n equals 10 you have something, and then at n equals 100 you have, so you have far more nodes that have higher degrees. Okay, so blue is the one with n equals 100. n equals 500, the, the distribution moves to the right. You have far more nodes that have higher degrees. So what happens is that if you, so basically, if you fix a particular, uh, if you fix a particular degree, as the size of the graph will grow, most of the, if you fix any finite degree, as the size of the graph grows, most of the nodes will exceed that threshold, will exceed that degree. So basically, all the node, all uh, the degrees of all the nodes will grow in an unbounded fashion. Okay. So before we go forward, uh, whatever we discussed uh, on other shiny graphs, is it clear to everyone? Are there any questions? Okay. So. So what we saw was that the degree distribution of Wadashwani graphs behave in a, has a Poisson distribution. It's like as a, in the asymptotic sense, or as the size of the graph grows, the degree distribution is Poissonian. Okay. Uh, however, uh, in the late 1990s, researchers started to realize that uh, real-world networks do not always show a Poissonian distribution. For example, this actor collaboration graph. Okay. If this is the log log plot, the actor collaboration graph is not Poissonian. The, uh, it's kind of, if it's linear, it's kind of linear. The tail of this distribution is linear in the log log plot. That means it cannot be a Poissonian distribution. The, this is the distribution of the World Wide Web uh, in this paper, reported in this paper. And again, the log log plot is kind of linear. And a Poissonian distribution cannot be linear in the log log plot. Okay? So, so therefore, the uh, empirical evidence suggests that real-world network often, this is important, often, it's not always, often exhibit a behavior that is the fraction of, uh, exhibit a power of behavior that is the fraction of nodes with degree d behaves like d to the minus alpha. Okay, whereas for Erdos-Schwenny graph, it would be something like e to the minus b. It would be, it would decay exponentially, whereas here is decaying polynomially. So the tail of the distribution is much more heavier than a, than a Poissonian tail. Uh, so therefore researchers, when this uh, empirical evidence came uh, into the community, researchers started to look for models which would explain uh, the emergence of this kind of behavior or, or power law behavior. So the Barabasi Albert model, which was proposed in 1989, became the first model which could explain this kind of behavior. And they, they did that by using concepts of growth and preferential attachment, which I will discuss uh, in the upcoming slides. But before I go forward, uh, the empirical evidence uh, in real-world networks, are these clear, or any questions on that? OK. So, so let me first describe the setting of growth models. Uh, so you start off at time t equals 0. First of all, these growth models will be indexed by t rather than n, because there's an inherent idea of time. Okay, As the time increases, your, your network grows. And therefore, I'm going to index these graphs with t. Okay, So at, the, at time t equals 0, you, have, you start off with a deterministic graph, and then as time increases, so suppose you have a graph g of t at time t, at time t plus 1, a new node comes in that's labeled t plus 1, and that node, t plus 1, will connect to a node, s of t plus 1, which is randomly selected from your, ex, from your vertex set, from your existing vertex set. Okay, so what, it, what that means is that, so at every time instant, a new node comes in, and it will connect to the existing nodes, according to certain attachment rule, according to a certain distribution, problem distribution over the existing vertices. Okay? So, the, so Barabas-Albert model 
implements what's called the preferential attachment rule. That is, the, the probability of connection, so as a new node comes in, the probability of connection to an existing node will be directly proportional to the degree of that node. Okay? So degree of that node, dt of s, so probability that t plus 1, the no, new node, connects to an existing node s is directly proportional to the degree of node s at time t. Okay? That's dt of s, d of t s. Okay? And so like, uh, the motivation behind this rule is that rich tend to get richer, although this is not always true. Okay? There are ex obviously, there are a lot of exceptions. But, so the motivation for this rule was that uh, a node which has higher degree will tend to attract more connections. Okay? So rich get richer. And one can show, actually it was shown in 2000, that the degree distribution of this model converges to a PMF which is power law, okay? So d to the minus 3, power law with parameter 3, okay? And therefore it was able to explain the emergence of power law behavior in many real world methods. Okay, okay so before, uh, so was the model, was the setting of the model clear to everyone? Are there any questions? Clear to everyone? Okay, so this is the plot of the so basically, if you're looking at n equals 50,000, so this is the plot of the empirical, uh, plot of the experimental distribution. So the theoretical should be like this. So the log log plot, the theoretical should be kind of a straight line, and the experimental is very much close to that. So visually also we can see that it follows very much, uh, it follows the experimental, uh, follows the power law distribution. What is happening towards the tail now? Is it the so basically, you're so at the tail. That's a that's a very good question because at the tail you are looking at the fraction of nodes that have higher degrees, and you need to increase the size of the graph for the law of large numbers to kind of kick in and for these numbers to kind of converge. You don't have that many nodes with high such high degrees. So basically, if I'm looking at say n equals say 500, then you would then these oscillations would start from here itself. Because the size of the graph isn't large enough. Okay. Maybe you can use that generate the model to draw the confidence interval for this particular curve. And then we can see whether this confidence interval increases at the same speed as... What yes, so basically you, what you're saying is that uh, this is just result of one run. You do multiple runs and uh, come up with a confidence interval, right? Yeah, because you have a generated model, right? Right. So basically, you can, can derive the variance for it at each degree. Exactly, yeah. And then Theoretical. you can enjoy, yeah. enjoy confidence yeah. in right. uh, power. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yes. Yes. yes, absolutely. Great. So, some comments on uh, whatever we have seen the, thus far. So, first of all, for the other training graphs, so we've not really talked about clustering coefficient thus far. So degree distribution has been the most important network property for us. Uh, and so if you're looking at arbitrary graphs, under the regime where you get, that's p equals c over n, under the regime where you get a non-trivial degree distribution, the clustering coefficients converge to zero, okay, for the arbitrary graph. And also for the baravasi Albert graph, which coming to think of it, it's really a tree, right? At the, in the simplest, if you're looking at the, uh, the, the balance sample graph that I described to you, it's basically a tree. You don't have any cycles. So again, the clustering coefficients will be zero, which is really not good. So other random graph models have been proposed. One among them is the watt stroke model, which exhibits clustering and also a small diameter, but possesses an unrealistic degree distribution. It doesn't have a power law or a heavy tail degree distribution. So as you can see, the hunt is on for looking for random graph models, which kind of uh, show a lot of diversity and also have properties, uh, who also have statistical properties which match that of many real world networks. It's difficult to come up with models whose statistical properties, uh, like many statistical property, properties match that of real world networks. Okay. So okay, so uh, let's uh, recap what we discussed thus far. Uh, first, we uh, described what a network was, and we motivated why we need to study networks. Uh, then we looked at network properties. We looked at two primary network properties: that's the degree distribution and the clustering coefficient. 
And then we introduced a mathematical model called the random graphs. And we motivated why we need to study random graphs. And we looked at two specific random graph models, that's the auditionary graph model and the balanced Albert model. Okay, and then we came up and we showed that these models have certain uh, limitations. Okay. Um, any questions? Are there no questions? Thank you. Let's say those are